that's, it's crazy how fast this year is going already, which, which means also that, as, as Meg pointed out, that Easter is just around the corner because that's in March this year. Um, and I just wanted to add on to what she said uh, that, you know, Easter is like the, the one Sunday when people who maybe don't ever think about church actually feel like they might be open to it. And so just to be thinking and praying about who you might be able to invite to come that morning uh, would, be, would be great. Also, I would say this, that uh, it means we could really use some extra help that morning, particularly in nursery. Uh, and so I just want to put an appeal out there. If you are someone who maybe even doesn't normally work uh, in nursery, but you'd be willing to for that one Sunday even. We could use uh, a couple of people, maybe three even, down there. And I know that's a hard ask for, for Easter Sunday, but uh, it's such a service to families, uh, young families who are visiting. And so think about that. We don't have a, I, I, I don't have a great mechanism for you to respond other than just come find me after the service and tell me and I'll make sure it gets passed on to the the right people for that. So for my story, my little uh, bit this morning, my, my intro, uh, we're going all the way to Pluto. I heard something about Pluto this week that it, it was kind of a mind bender for me. I don't know if it will be for you, but apparently in June of this year, Pluto will be completing its first orbit around the sun to the same spot since Independence Day 1776. And I thought about that and going, that one loop encompassed the entire history of the United States. You know, and in that time, it was discovered as a planet. It was named. It was called the ninth planet in our solar system, and then it was demoted to a dwarf. And so it's, it's, that's a, a lot that has transpired in that time. And, you know, here it is. It's the, the kind of the least significant. It's the, it's the planet that gets joked about, uh, and it's, it's the smallest, and it's the furthest away. And yet when you put it in that perspective that it, it encircles our entire history, you kind of, it, it takes on this greatness and this magnitude that feels like we're the small ones in the face of that. And I was thinking about the story that we're going to look at this morning, which is, is Jesus' interaction with this woman that a lot of people would have considered really insignificant. And also it's literally talking about crumbs, which are just so tiny. Uh, and yet, as we get into the story, I think we'll see that it's, it's actually just this incredible, great gospel story. So we're back again in the book of Mark. We're into chapter 7 now, and we're picking up midway through the chapter. And Mark says that Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. Now, the... Just to kind of give us again some little orientation here on the map, he was the where he started out was down there by the Sea of Galilee, and and traveled north to the the region of Tyre here. That uh, it's about a 35, 40 minute or thirty five forty miles uh, to the north of of Galilee, and it would be somewhere in that area, modern day. Lebanon, Syria, and, and what's significant about that would have, would have been that that was, that was not Jewish territory. That was Gentile region. And, and Jesus is just coming off of a conversation that he had with the Pharisees and teachers of the law about clean versus unclean stuff. And they were, they were kind of consumed with this idea of of what they would come in contact with that might contaminate them or make them unclean. And he's like, you know what? All this stuff you're worried about contact and really what, what makes you really clean is, 
it's coming from the inside. Like, this is great, but it's not going to really prevent you from what's deep within you that needs addressing. And that's what Jesus came to, to deal with. And so, so right on the heels of that conversation, he goes to a place that many of his peers would have considered to be sort of this potential place for contamination and uncleanness. And he's coming in contact with Gentiles here. And so, uh, so he's, he's just showing them in the way he's living this out, uh, the, that other people are not what make you uh, unclean. That, that comes from within. So he entered a house there, and he didn't want anyone to know it, yet he could not ke- keep his presence a secret. Why wouldn't he want people to know it at this point? It's, it's not because they're Gentiles. What, any thoughts from what we looked at uh, in the last couple of weeks? Crowds coming, yes. Yes, he, he didn't want, he'd been trying to get rest for his disciples, right? We saw how that was such a, a challenge before. Now he's pulled away. Maybe that's partly what in, inspired him to get further away from Galilee, was to have more space away from where his reputation was growing so much, but didn't, didn't quite work. Uh, in fact, As soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an evil spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek born in Syrian Phoenicia, and she begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. Now, when it says there that she was Greek, that's really not an ethnic reference there. That's saying that she was Gentile, basically, that she was part of this Hellenized culture, and so then it, but when it gives us the distinction that she was Syrophoenician, uh, that that's really more of her cultural heritage. And I, I was looking at that this week and, and kind of tracing the, the background of the Syrophoenician people who really trace their roots to the Canaanites uh, that were in the land there from ancient times, and it really just struck me that that's the same ancestral heritage as the Palestinian people today. And, and to cast that in a modern light of Jesus having this interaction with a Palestinian mom who is agonizing for her child and thought... Jesus' care and concern for her in that play. It puts it in a, it just brings it right forward to today. Uh, and I thought it would be fitting just right here before we go any further. It, and and this, this is not rehearsed or anything, but is there anybody who would um, just be willing to lead us in a, in a brief prayer for the Palestinians uh, this morning? Anybody um, up, for, up for that? Or I can do it if 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 it's not. Uh... All right, I'll I'll lead us. I just uh, God, this is this is not um, this is not about politics. This is not about about making any statement. This is just uh, inviting Christ once again. Would you come in your mercy into this situation where there's so much deep suffering? Lord, that is uh, unfathomable to us. It is, it is beyond our comprehension or even our context to understand. And I thank you for individual stories of you meeting people who are deeply, deeply uh, hurting. And you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we know that in you, there is neither Jew nor Gentile. And so, because of your cross, we, we all come to you the same way. And we're all um, in your care. And so, God, would you, would you bring your mercy and grace to this situation that is so beyond words for us today and for all the people who are, are suffering so greatly? Um, just pray your, your mercy, your presence, 
and your power in it, Lord, uh, and, and somehow, Lord, find, find a way for peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, thank you. Um, so this, this woman comes to Jesus, and she, she begs him to drive the demon out of her daughter. And then this is, this is his rather strange response. First, let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Yes, Lord, she replied, but even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her, for such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Well, I don't know about you, but that's kind of a hard story to read how Jesus interacts. It's kind of jarring, isn't it? The, his, his choice of language there just feels a little bit uncomfortable. And it got me thinking of kind of a larger couple of questions that this story raises for me. I don't know if it does for you, but the first one would be, what do I do when Jesus offends me? We live in such offendable times right now, right? I mean, everything is offensive to somebody. Everybody is, is thin. Everybody is ready just to, to be up in arms about something right now, right? And, and it's so easy at this point, you know, that's, what, that's why they call this cancel culture because it's just so easy to write people off disconnect from them, all those kinds of things. But what do you do? What do you do? And it's something that Jesus is saying that offends you. How do you, how do you cope with that? Uh, and especially if you don't have context, you're just hearing his words and you go, I don't, I don't know what to do with that, but it really bothers me. And, and uh, so it's easy to to do the same thing with Jesus and, and want to write him off. The other question that this raises for me, though, is what do I do when Jesus says no? Because that seems like his first response to this woman is, is kind of shutting her down. And, and so what do I do in the face of that as well? Those are, those are the questions that I want to think about with you a little bit this morning. But I want to start with that first one and just go, that word, offend, what uh, what comes to mind when? How do you define being offended? Not that you know, but you've heard. How are people? How have you seen people be offended? What does that mean? What when you're offended? Like to say that. Take it personally. Yeah. You have to be kind of already cracked and fragile. Like if you're mm. very steady and calm, like, it's easy to not take offense. Yeah. But if something you're already doubting about yourself, your identity, your performance, mm. your anything, then any kind of little thing will offend. So right. You're already... So it's, it's a statement about myself, actually, when I get offended. Yeah. Kind of. It's, it's revealing something about... Oh, I don't like that, but <laughs> thanks anyway. <laughs> That's offensive, Julia. I don't... <laughs> yeah, no, that, I think that's really true, though. Anything else that comes to mind for... There's judgment involved. Like, this yes. Is wrong. Yes. This is not how it should be. Right, exactly. The offense sometimes comes off as a surprise, too. You're sometimes set back by it. Yeah. Right, yeah, I think it is. It's a little, you're, there's a little shock involved with it there. Yeah. I think when someone is trampling on the values that you have, mm. it can feel like offensive and caught off guard. It takes a while to. Yeah. I think it, it, it may be, maybe we believe so deeply in something that we assume everybody shares that, and when they don't, it, it really is, is troubling. Yeah. And when, when it's Jesus and we think something's true about him and it feels like this thing is calling that into question, that, that makes it hard. 
So here's some times when I think I'm likely to get offended. You can see if you have anything that you would add to the list, but this is really revealing something about me apparently now, according to uh, Julia. So uh, maybe, maybe you won't want to share your own on this list, but Uh, You know, I think when life feels unfair, when I think something different should be happening for me than it is, that that gets me offended. When I see injustices going unchecked, either for individuals or just around the world, global things happening, I can get offended by them. And and, um, when scripture sounds harsh, I mean, I didn't sometimes realize how harsh some passages are, how difficult they can be, until I started reading them with my children. And, you know, I, and having to kind of pick and choose, going what feels age appropriate, and then you go, oh, oh, this is, this is harder than I thought. Um, and so, but yeah, there are some that you read, and with no context, you go, what, what is that all about? Uh, sometimes God just feels like he's, not answering, and that can feel offensive. Um, people, when people have a tone, I don't. I can, I can acknowledge that they're saying the right thing, but they're just saying it in a way that is so irksome that I, I can't, um, I can't really hear them. Uh, or Christians act offensively. You know, these are when when. Jesus' representatives are the ones who feel like they are doing damage, and you go, Lord, why? Why is this your your church? Why did you choose this to be the way to get the message out about you? Um, And then I'm offended when I'm called out. Like, when, when something is, and this again gets back to Julia's comment, but when when it's dealing with what's going on inside me, that, that can be offensive. And that will probably always be offensive. Um, Peter wrote and, and called Jesus a stone of stumbling and a, a rock of offense. There is something that is, we can't get around being offended by Jesus in, in one level. Um, Paul talked about the offense of the cross because here's God's salvation plan for us, but what it means is that I have to look at that there's, There's something that I actually need forgiving for, that I actually need that mercy to apply uh, to me. And so can't can't quite get around that. Uh, Any anything else that you would add to that list of offensives? Things that Well for me, uh Christ, I get offended when people say something nasty about it. Mm. I, I get kind of... Mm. So you get defensive on his behalf. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. You know, that, that makes sense. And that kind of ties in with what Karin was saying about when our, when our values feel like they're being trampled on or things that are important to us. Yeah. Yeah, Dean? Being falsely accused. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Back to, back to the, the injustice sense. It's not fair, yeah. Yeah, Becky. Uh, well, I've had something I've been wrestling with since the Palestinian, uh, all that came down. And I was praying and God says, don't take sides. Mm-hmm. And I said, but I want to take a side because I, you know. Mm-hmm. And he said, this is not for you mm-hmm. to be offended. Mm-hmm. Uh, you just need to let this Mm. run its course mm. where, where we can't get invested in this mm. ourselves we can pray mm. but we can't be offended by it because mm. this is something larger than us but I've been wrestling with it all mm. along because I really yeah. want to be offended yeah. um, because I have close friends that are Jewish and it, it it's hurtful Sure. So yeah. they're extremely angry Yeah. but it's something bigger than us yeah. And so that's, yeah. I'm confessing it. Yeah, no, I think that's a really, that is a really good and honest, thank you for, for sharing that, because I think that is, that's the bind that we find ourselves in. And, and often, too, sometimes we find ourselves so easily offended over other people's situations, 
and, and we go, God, why, why are you allowing this? Why is, um, it, it just gets really complicated. So yeah, I, I, I think that word from him would be good for all of us to go, this is, these things are bigger than, than you. And um, being, being able to sit with, and that's hard. That's hard. Um, so, what, what do I do with that? Well, I just want to give you a couple of thoughts out of this story of, of when, when Jesus offends me, I can lean into what I know, okay? If, he, if I feel like he's doing something or not doing something that's bothering me, I, I can go back to the things that I know are true about him. So, for example, when I read this story, what I think when I read it is that Jesus sounds rude and harsh, but what I know about Jesus is, is first that he loves me more than anybody else could. He says that in, in John, greater love has nobody than this and to lay down his life for his friends. Uh, and, and Paul tells us that love is not rude. So if I know those two things are, are stated explicitly in Scripture, and, and Jesus has included this story, the Lord has allowed this to be this story to be part of his word next to these other things, then, then I, need to, I need to hang on. I don't have to let go of how this feels over here, but I need to hang on to what I know is true because he's, he stated it outright. Or uh, I might think Jesus seems dismissive here of this woman. Well, we know that he treated outcasts with, with dignity, and we also know that he honored women uh, and and we can see a difference even from, from the culture around him. Christy McClelland says it this way. She says, in the first century world before Jesus upended things, all spiritual teaching was for men. In his approach to teaching and his earthly ministry, Jesus said to women in the first century, you are part of this story too. And we see that repeatedly in his interactions with women. Uh, or, you know, just in general, I might think that Jesus feels absent. And what I know, though, is that he's right here. He, he is present with us. And he's also said he won't leave. And so those are things to hang on to in the midst of, of what it feels like. Or I think that Jesus is just plain wrong. Well, he isn't. <laughs> um Hebrews says he, he never, he's without sin. He, he doesn't, he, he's not making mistakes. He, he's completely other than us, uh, but, but he's not wrong. And, and also my view of things is, is partial. Paul says that we're seeing through a glass dimly. We don't see, we see some things, but it's maybe not as, as clear as, it think, as we think that it is. So, so, this, of course, uh, assumes that we know some of these things, that we are invested enough in Scripture to have some anchors to hold on to. And so, that's just a, that's a challenge because as you hear some of these things, they, they lead you to not lean in further to Scripture because you go, if it says that, I don't, I don't want it. I don't want it. Uh, and, but I would encourage you to go the other way and actually get to know uh, some of these greater truths about Christ because Scripture interprets Scripture for us and we can, we can understand the, the more murky things by knowing what he stated very clearly. Uh, so one other thing that I think we do when Jesus offends us, and, and this is tied into that idea that we don't see the whole thing, is that we've got to hang on to humility in the face of it. Uh, I think it was Ricky Gervais who said, <laughs> just because you're offended doesn't mean you're right, you know? Um, and, and that's really good to hold on to, that uh, we, we've got to have a certain humility because we don't see the whole situation. We don't, we're, we're divided by culture so often from what's in Scripture. We're divided by... Uh, time and we don't have the nuances of how things are said. We don't have the full conversation. We actually know from Matthew that there was more to this conversation than there's recorded for us in Mark. Uh, 
and all these, all these pieces, we don't know what Jesus' intent was fully with this, this woman. And so, so to hang on to humility around that, I think, is really important. Oswald Chambers, I don't know if you've ever heard Oswald Chambers and Ricky Gervais quoted side by side before. <laughs> so this may be a first. But he said, whenever our right becomes the guiding factor of our lives, it dulls our spiritual insight. And here's the thing that I think is really important is, is noting that the woman herself shows no sign of offense toward what Jesus is doing here with her. Uh, she is not digging in and saying, how dare you in the way he responds to her. She's not clinging on to some right to treatment in here. And she actually sees spiritually what is going on here in a, in a way that other people haven't. And we're going to get to that in, in just a second. But, you know, I can't carry around more offense for her than she's carrying around when, when actually she ended up having this really great exchange with Jesus. Uh, so, yeah, we've got to hang on. We've got to hang on to humility. Any, any other thoughts on that piece before I jump to the second question? Yeah, Drew. Given where they are in Tyre, isn't it plausible that like the Jewish community have dogs under the table where they are? Mm. Like among among the majority Greek area, this is not an area where, mm. where the Israelites are majority. And so it's like a thought exercise that he's putting at her, and it just really upends yes. everything about this yes. that he's putting in front of her. Yeah. And the fact all these times Jesus is encountering people. He responds when people recognize his authority. Mm-hmm. Like that's just such a big thing. And that his authority is so great that this child who's far off can be healed. It's this incredible display of it. Yeah. As this woman accepts this subversion that to her is just such a strange thing for him. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and we we will we will get a little more into his authority here in a minute. Yeah, Julia. I'm thinking about how um you, you started out by talking about how he's, he's challenging the Jewish understanding of law right before that. Right, right. Which makes it kind of look like now he's challenging that. Part. He's allowing this woman to come in mm. and have the authority to mm. challenge the Jewish law. Mm. He's putting her in and he's saying, whoa, what you said is actually like undoing everything. And, and it kind of makes me think of like the idea of crumbs and how earlier... In the Jewish territory, he feeds the five thousand, yeah. and then there comes this story, and then the next thing he does, and he goes, he does the same thing for the Gentiles. He does the four thousand mm-hmm. yes. in the Gentile territory. So it's almost like this woman, like, is kind of the crust of mm-hmm. like how their the, the turn happens from Jews to Gentiles. Yeah, yeah, that's really good. I love that. Yeah, yeah, it really is. Um, and I want to get more into her exchange with him here in a, in a second because, yeah. Well, I think sometimes it has to do with trying to like, solve everything ourselves, mm. whether it's like our beliefs or like who we want to be friends with or just like whatever. And if we were to just like, look at God more and not try to be the fixer. Yes. <laughs> I think that is so well said. Like, we, we do, we try to, we imagine it's all on us to, to fix and sort out and figure out. And um, that, that's part of that humility, I think, of, of um, putting it back in God's hands because he's God. He's the one who knows when we don't. And there's so much that we don't know. And so, yeah, that's really good. Thank you for that. Well, what do we do when Jesus says no? here. I, I think first thing that we see with this woman is you find the invitation inside the no. There's an, it's, it, look back again at this, this response from Jesus, the first response from Jesus. He says, first let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Okay, we can hear that we can hear that interchange a lot of different ways. You can hear it as an ethnic slur, sort of as 
Uh, Jesus talking about the children of Israel versus the Gentile dogs. Sometimes that's, that's how the Israelites framed the different uh, division there. The word that he's using for dogs is not like the yard dogs, the straight. It's not the same as that. It's the, it's the house pets, the little dogs that are under the table and inside and kind of part of the family. Um, another, another thought is that the children that he's referring to could be his disciples that he's dealing with them. He's been trying to get them rest and saying the priority right now is, is rest for them. But really what you see in that response, it's not a no, an outright no. It's a, it's a matter of priorities, right? He's saying first this has to happen. This, this, is, this is what is, is in sequence. And... and the woman latches on to that, and we'll see, we'll see in her response how she does that here in a second. But, but Jesus is saying, look, I've got to deal with Israel first because it's their rejection that is going to lead to the cross, that is going to lead to salvation for the whole world. So he's very focused in his, in his mission here, but there's room in there for her to, to grab on to that. Um, and, and to, uh, to not get stuck in the offense and, and to, to move um, towards, still towards asking that request in, a, in maybe a little different way. Um, Hannah Massad, that I've talked about a few times, who was the pastor in Gaza, the only pastor for a long time. Uh, now he runs Christian Mission to Gaza there. He, said, he sent out a newsletter this, this week that had some, some pictures and a story. He, he was talking about a woman, a local woman there who bakes bread for the local community that's, that's still there. And his people from his mission go and, and help distribute that bread. But he sent these pictures that I thought were quite striking. Because first, he showed the the oven there, that you look at that oven and you go, that, that feels like it could have been straight out of the Bible. Like it, it, it's the same, same system there. And then, and then you see these, these children waiting for this bread. And, and you go, it's heartbreaking to see that, right? They're so, they're so hungry. And you think, okay, well, as a parent, as, one of the, as somebody distributing bread to them, if you had said, uh, "Okay, this I, I'm going to I'm going to feed the pets first, and then and then you can have," uh, you can see where that morally there was there was something wrong with there would be something wrong with that order. And Jesus is conveying to this woman a, a moral order to his own actions. He's explaining his responsibility in what he's doing, and the order that he's he's operating in more than making a derogatory comment about her. And so she hears this invitation in there that, that it's children first and, and to go, okay, I'm not only going to hear this parable, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to expand on it. And this is the first person we have in the entire book of Mark who actually gets one of Jesus' parables, who understands what he's saying. You know, his, his disciples repeatedly do not follow what he's talking about, and she gets it. And not only does she get it, she takes it and she makes it her own, and she, she turns it back around on Jesus and said, okay, well, if that's true, then there are some other things that would be true as well. And, and Jesus, Jesus responds to that. And I, and I love that. Uh, there's a quote from Victor Cole who says, Jesus always responds to faith. Doesn't matter who it's coming from. You look in scripture and you see when somebody's exhibiting faith over and over again, that's what Jesus responds to. And this woman, in her audacity back to Christ, demonstrates this huge amount of faith in who he is. Uh, so, here, here are some things that she does because she looks, she looks for crumbs. If, if Jesus is, is saying that he's going to feed the kids, well, guess what? Um, when, when there's kids eating, crumbs happen when kids are eating, right? If you're going to talk about feeding the children, then let's talk about it. 
there's going to be some crumbs, and no one withholds crumbs from the dogs under the table. In fact, that's kind of helpful because they're cleaning up, right? They're, they're dealing with stuff that nobody else wants. It's, it's just waste, and it's lost on everybody. So let the dogs have it. And guess what? The dogs can do that at the same time that the kids are eating. So this moves from being sequential, kids first, to going, this can be simultaneous. This can happen at the same time. And, and it's brilliant. It's brilliant. And Jesus is delighted with this response from her. And, and he's able to uh, answer her request right there. Uh, and and, and he, he gives the woman exactly what she's asking for. He gives her just a crumb. He doesn't, even, he doesn't even speak a word of healing. He just says it's done. He doesn't get up from his seat at the table. He doesn't leave. He doesn't interrupt his mission one bit. It's not like it's taking away from what he's doing. He just gives her all that she needs, and it's more than enough. Uh, several years ago in Jordan, archaeologists discovered this fire pit that is thousands of years old, long before Christ. Uh, and, and inside, I think that's a pretty cool-looking fire pit, actually. I wouldn't mind having that. But, but inside the fire pit, they found this, these, um, this material, and it wasn't dirt, and they were, they were analyzing it as these little particles, and lo and behold, it's breadcrumbs. Uh, it's the world's oldest breadcrumbs, and they could tell it because of its composition. They could identify the grains in the dough of the bread, and and it was still recognizable as, as those crumbs. And, and here's the thing about crumbs. Crumbs are fully bred in miniature, right? Everything about bread, the composition of it, is right there in that crumb. Everything about Jesus is, is true in just a word from him. Like, we have the full power and access. This is why this woman is exhibiting so much faith. She's like, I don't need a bunch of your time. I just need you to say that this is done. And and we see over and over again in Scripture where all it takes is a single touch of the hem of his garment, and that woman is healed. All it takes is a single look from him to Peter, and Peter is undone after his denial. All it takes is a single command, and the, the deaf man's ears are are opened, a single invitation from Christ, and Lazarus walks out of the tomb. It, it just takes the tiniest crumb of, of uh, a, an interaction with Christ to, to be fully containing the power of the truth of who he is and what he's done for us and the gospel. He is everywhere, and he's available to all of us. It doesn't matter where we are in the priorities of uh, whatever, that, that, that we're all simultaneously invited to the table in one way or another, and, and we just need a crumb. Uh, and it just takes a, a tiny bit of faith to grab onto that crumb and find him in it. And I think it's, it's very fitting that we're coming to the Lord's table today in, an, in a minute. And, and I'm just, uh, I'm, before, before we go there, I'm just curious, has anybody had just a crumb lately that you can testify to, the smallest thing that you have, you have seen Christ in meet you in a, in a word, in a song, in, a, in an interaction with somebody that, that you've found him in a surprising way. Any examples come to mind for anybody? I have an example. Yeah. Um, and I want to first talk about how it, the reason it's an example is because of my previous offense. Mm. So one of my areas of offense, which has been, I know that it is my own, because the word of God is a beautiful, amazing 
day, kind songs and words from other sisters and brothers in Christ should be received, not rejected with offense. But part of my story is when somebody hears something from me and says, can I pray for you? I'm offended. Hmm. Not anymore. So, um, and that's something you guys need to know about me. People that are close to me recognize that if I'm sharing something that's raw and you give me a Bible verse, it'll piss me off. Hmm. And um, some of you have experienced that. So my crumb this past week was one of my sisters sent me a beautiful song and I was able to open it hmm. and I was able to receive it. And I was able to worship. Mm. And that might not seem like a big deal. But to me, I shared last week that I've had a lot of things in the physical realm that feel very ridiculous. Mm. And I said, you can ask me for the list. It's pretty nuts. But um, we can just go down all of them. But, and I've been saying, Lord, I need, some, I need to see some manifestation of your crumbs. Like, I mm. need some fruit. And, um, so that's a testimony. I'm yeah. receiving God's love through sisters and brothers in the church in new ways that previously I knew that that was my own offense because when somebody gives you a Bible verse, it would be nice to be able to receive yeah. that. Yeah. 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 I love that. Anyway, so that's a yes. Thank you. Thank you. That's really good. I saw a, I saw a hand over. Yeah, Meg. Um, um, anyway, I was just going to say, I hard week and um, I was in the midst of a hard situation and I was feeling really pretty undone by it. Um, and right in the middle of feeling undone is not a time when I'm usually quick to ask people to pray for me. Um, I kind of get pretty independent, I feel isolated in it. Um, but in that moment, I like reached out to like five people and texted and asked for prayer. I just felt like I had to. And like in the minutes after that, like the situation I was in got like exponentially worse. Um, which, you know, I wish that the answer to the prayer was the situation getting better. But what I felt like, like the crumb that I got was that the Holy Spirit knew that I was going to need some people praying mm -hmm. for me mm -hmm. in what was about to happen. Mm -hmm. And so it felt like a real gift to me that I felt compelled yeah. to ask people to pray in a situation when I usually wouldn't. Mm -hmm. And it was exactly what I was about to need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Jesus. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. That's really good. Any other crumbs? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. I don't know who she is, but she referred to God as the fixer, mm -hmm. and and how sometimes we just have to acknowledge that He's the fixer. And you don't hear that that exact word used very often in relation to God. I mean, He fixes things, but He's the fixer. And God very specifically gave me that word about Himself years ago. Mm -hmm. In regards to my daughter, so yeah, it's, she's been very heavy on my heart, and mm -hmm. praying about it this morning again. God, what should I do? What should I do? And, and to remember mm -hmm. that he's the fixer, and he's the one who mm -hmm. knows the whole big story. Mm -hmm. so, that was a crumb. Yeah. That was a crumb that, in real time. Wow. Yeah. And that's Joey, by the way. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you for, for those testimonies. Let's, uh, let's pray, and we'll, we'll go to the Lord's table this morning. God, I... Uh, I thank you. I'm sure we could have gone on for hours of things that we've recognized and seen your hand at work in small ways and big ways. And God, there is no small uh, appearance of you. It, it is all the fullness of who you are for us in even the tiniest little interaction or encounter with you. Uh, you, are, you are always fully present to us. And Lord, as we come to your table now, would you, you meet us again uh, as, as we um, physically take in these, these bits of bread? Um, 
we, we latch on to your work and your presence uh, that we need so desperately. And um, pray that you'd meet each person this morning in a new way. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Oh, and I skipped, I didn't even, I didn't even get to my favorite guy, PT, here for a quote. He said, God's object with us is not to give just so many things and withhold so many. It's to place us in the tissue of his kingdom. He said, his best answer to us is to raise us to the power of answering him. And I think that's really what we saw in that, in that woman's story of where he took her to a place where she is answering him fully and, and just expressing such full faith in him. Well, I, I always read the same passage that, that Paul wrote for us when he said, I received from the Lord what I passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. He broke it into these little pieces, these little crumbs, and, and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take that together. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's drink it together. Thank you, thank you, Jesus, for these symbols that remind us that, that we have access to all of you clear until you come back for us. What a, what a gift and a promise. Um, seal that in us, I pray. Amen. I invite you guys to stand.